new monoclonal antibody therapies for Alzheimer's disease and blood-based biomarker tests have made discussions about diagnosis and treatment of memory disorders more complicated. As more people gain access to and seek out biomarker testing, both memory specialists and primary care physicians may have trouble keeping up. I'm Stephen Morrissey, Managing Editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, and I'm talking with Nathaniel Chin, an Associate Professor in the Division of Geriatrics and Gerontology and Medical Director of the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center at the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health. Dr. Chin has co-authored a perspective article about the role of primary care in diagnosing and treating memory disorders. Dr. Chin, how have evaluations for memory disorders typically been conducted, and then what would happen after a diagnosis was made? I would say it depends on the setting in which the memory evaluation is happening. Now, for our purpose, we're talking about primary care, in which case this question of memory change could be happening in the midst of talking about other chronic health conditions or at the last minute of a 15-minute visit. And so it could be multiple visits of talking about a person who is reporting thinking change, perhaps a family member who's noticing these changes but afraid to bring it up. And ultimately, there's this exploration of what exactly is a person experiencing, what are examples of those thinking changes. And then usually some blood work to look for reversible causes, and then maybe a cognitive screening test, not something that's definitive, but maybe something that's about 15 minutes long. And at that point, depending on the family and the clinician and the patient, there could be this presumptive diagnosis. Oftentimes people will use the word Alzheimer's disease when in fact they mean dementia. And depending on how aggressive a person is, meaning the clinician or the patient, there could be this referral to a specialist. And that evaluation is a little bit more intensive. It's a little bit more comprehensive, but that is in essence sort of the usual process that one could experience in a primary care setting. And then in your perspective article, you describe the effect of these new monoclonal antibody therapies on diagnosis and treatment processes. So how do those therapies work and how is it determined whether a patient is eligible for them? The medications work through an intravenous route. So a person has an IV place, they're going to an infusion center, at least as of now, and the medication is a monoclonal therapy. And so it goes into the vein, it goes into the bloodstream, into the brain, crossing the blood-brain barrier, and it removes the first protein of Alzheimer's disease called amyloid. So it removes the amyloid protein probably through a couple of mechanisms. One, the breakdown of the protein itself from these antibodies and or two, stimulating microglia or the inflammatory cell to then go and attach to the protein and break it down. And so this process has been shown to be effective in clinical trials through multiple agents. But with it, the success of this removal of amyloid protein has really brought a focus to if we can offer a new therapy to people, they now want to be evaluated, which makes sense. It's helped reduce some of the stigma of that process Now, to be eligible for it, though, a person has to have a diagnosis of mild cognitive impairment or mild stage dementia. And so you need to have this syndromic diagnosis first, and then you need to have evidence that that amyloid protein is actually in the brain because the medication won't work if there's not actual elevated amyloid protein. So how have those therapies affected the conversations that you're having in the clinic? I would say it's a mixture of both hope and excitement about having a new therapy that could remove this protein that we know is a part of Alzheimer's disease and in clinical trials has slowed the process of cognitive decline, but it's also made it so much more complicated because now we really need to have biological evidence of Alzheimer's. And so clinical judgment is important, but it's not enough when it comes to being eligible for the therapy. There's this conversation about other indications or or other contraindications for the therapy. So reviewing the medical record, not just for understanding risk factors for thinking change, but now trying to understand, is this too high of a risk for you? This involves genetic testing, which is a new level of discussion in a clinic. And then certainly the whole process of these infusions, looking at side effects like ARIA, looking at the screening MRIs that are involved, even just coordinating with the infusion center. All of these things are discussed as we talk about risk benefit, eligibility, or contraindication. And that's not even talking about then the financial cost of all of it. You say in your article that many observers believe that diagnosing Alzheimer's disease will soon have to happen in primary care. So why is that the case? The sheer number of people 
who are getting older is immense. And so every baby boomer will turn 65 or older by 2030. So that's over 70 million people. And we know that age is the greatest risk factor for developing cognitive symptoms. And as we have done an improved job of actually destigmatizing thinking change, more and more people are willing to come in to talk about the things they're experiencing, which is wonderful. But as a result of this, more and more people need to be evaluated for their thinking changes. And the excitement around biomarkers has been this idea that, well, now we can have biological proof of something happening in the brain. But with that come the nuances of understanding what are these changes? How do we handle these changes? Is this really the cause of my thinking change? And so there's just not enough specialists to be able to have those very personal but very detailed conversations with people. And so primary care is really the easier access point. And your primary care provider usually knows the patient the best. They're usually able to talk to them about reversible factors. They have the rapport to talk to patients about thinking change and the emotional response and the coping that comes with having a thinking change. And so primary care really is perfectly situated, at least within our healthcare system, to start the conversation. The problem is they just don't have the resources, the infrastructure, the training, as the perspective piece discusses. What kind of training would they need and what kind of infrastructure do you see being necessary? Well, the training is really, in my opinion, and based on what we wrote in the article, this idea of understanding the syndrome. What is normal aging versus abnormal processes in the brain? So understanding that then being able to understand the impact of cognitive symptoms on function, daily function, the instrumental activities of daily living, the basic activities of daily living, and then looking for reversible factors, understanding other non-brain diseases that could actually cause not only symptoms, but impairments on testing or screening tests. And so primary care providers have expressed throughout multiple surveys, not feeling confident in understanding mild cognitive impairment understanding the cognitive screening tests and interpreting those results, as well as even just discussing the cognitive diseases. And so I think we can, through education, through, as we propose, CMEs or state medical board requirements, we can help provide that knowledge and confidence in understanding cognitive change, understanding potential diseases, but not necessarily having to evaluate for those specific changes, because that is a really intensive process. And that requires a lot of understanding of biomarkers. And so we propose in this paper that if we are more pragmatic, if we reach out to primary care to help them understand the beginning part of this process, well, then the specialist can be able to delve into the deeper neurodegenerative diseases, the biomarkers, these new novel therapies. So we can actually approach this as a team and have primary care really because they know the patients the best, start with those fundamental things of the history as well as reversible factors. So finally, Carrying that a step further, in a well-supported system, how would you envision PCPs and memory specialists working together to diagnose and treat memory disorders? Primary care needs more support. And so you asked this in the earlier question of infrastructure. So primary care providers need more time with patients. This is not an easy process to talk to someone in their families about thinking change, about the potential for dementia. So primary care doctors need more than 14 to 24 minutes with a patient. They need a team to be able to rely on the expertise of social workers, nurses, medical assistants, even neuropsychologists when they have access to those individuals. And nowadays, we're talking more about patient navigators. They need an expert in helping patients and families navigate the healthcare system living with thinking change. So if primary care has that infrastructure and that support from the healthcare system, the state and federal governments, then they would be able to evaluate patients, make appropriate referrals. And then specialists would be able to go deeper in exploring what is the actual disease causing these syndromes of mild cognitive impairment and dementia. They could then go through the risk benefit of monoclonal therapies or whatever the next therapy will be, and then be able to help provide more of that infrastructure for post-diagnosis care, which is really critical. And CMS has come out with the guide model, which is really a nice way of trying to provide a standard approach, comprehensive approach to the evaluation of cognitive changes, as well as provide respite care, as well as provide family member and support care. And so the union of primary care and specialty care could further this if we have very clear roles and areas of confidence that we feel like we are the best situated to do 
but it does require really great communication between primary care and specialty care once we have that infrastructure. Thank you, Dr. Chin.